Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number two, seven, one. That's dos, siete, uno. Dos, siete, uno. Que tal, mi amigos? Good. How am I doing? I'm doing pretty well, man. It's a new year. First episode of the new year, actually. Been a bit slacking. Um, that's a long way to kind of, you know, let the new year pass by about uploading an episode. And, you know, as um as it's a, as it's a tradition with most content creators online, I'm going to make various excuses as to why I haven't been uploaded. But I'm hesitant to do so because in my real life, if you know me, you would know that I'm not the complainer. I'm not the moaner. I'm not the whinger. I'm not the excuse maker. So I'm going to hold my hands up and just say, you know what? I've been slacking. I've been a bit lazy. I've been concentrating on other things. I've taken priority as opposed to uploading my podcast. But I do enjoy doing them, right? It's my passion, something I've been looking forward to doing for a long time. And it's a hobby that I find, yes, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hobby of mine that I'm very passionate about, right? Um, it'll be amazing if in the future sometime Dick can go into a full-time thing. But for now, having the ability to collect all these amazing stories and snippets and little articles on the interwebs, compile them into a list, and then speaking about them to you, my captive audience, brings me a lot of joy. So I hope you got the joy too from listening to the podcast. So yeah, here we are, New Year. Toast to us. Got a bit of whiskey in here, as you can tell from the glass. When I say a bit, I'll say a, a healthy adult amount. So cheers to you, whoever you are. We're starting the year strong, man. We're starting it strong. Um, as I mentioned previously, I've got a few New Year's resolutions that I've written down. Um, again, New Year's resolutions for me aren't the most, you know, helpful thing. But for me, I like to have a little bit of, um, I like to have guardrails in my life. If I don't have guardrails, I tend to go a bit off, off, off rails, right? No, for no pun intended. So um, guardrails for me, drinking wise, is like, you know, make sure I don't drink Monday to Friday, only on the Saturdays going forward. Um, I don't have any spare booze left at home. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, I'm trying to lose weight for my marathon running that I'm going to be doing. I'm running my first 5K at the end of February. So that'll be cool. So for that to be a success and for me to get the best possible time that I can get, I need to shed the pounds. So I'm looking to lose about 20 to 30 pounds, get to a target weight of 190 by the end of the year or maintain that weight because I've done it before previously. If you know my weight loss journey, you'll know that I shed a picture a couple of years ago where I lost a bunch of weight. I went from like 270 to like my lightest was like 187. And um, I did that pretty well, but I didn't keep it off, unfortunately. And I kind of ballooned back up again. But I think my my kind of walking around weight, a weight that I can kind of maintain pretty easily if I just be sensible, is probably about 190, 200, right? Uh, 185, 180 will be a good thing, but I don't think I can probably sustain that, you know, all year round. But the goal is at the end of the year, I want to clock in at, somewhere around the 9 190 mark or exactly 190 and of course i've got um the whole reading stuff i'm doing quite often i'm doing a lot as well i'm sure you guys are aware of that i've just finished a few books here that i've got um so i'm reading one one hour a day a physical book and i'm also listening one hour a day to an audio podcast and that's basically it isn't it really yeah so the yeah obviously we're losing weight ties in with the running so i'm running at, oh i'm trying to clear my minimum running distance for the week is 10 miles so I have to do 10 miles a week. It de depends. It's up to me how I split it. If I do two five-mile days, it's fine. If I do whatever, it's fine. But for the most part, I'm following this CrossFit Endurance module, which is this book here, which I've mentioned a few times to people on the podcast. I'm sure you've heard me rabbit on about this, but it's a CrossFit Endurance book. I've kind of, I'm using this as a sort of framework. And essentially, it kind of lists out a workout plan that you can do. Got it here, right, in the book. So there's a workout plan there. And it kind of lists it by, uh, obviously, by day along the top and then here by level of difficulty and also on that side by the week. So for the most part, if I look on here, week two, I did today like a four, three mile run, which I wasn't meant to do. I was actually meant to go to the gym, but I left my pass at home. But I'm going to go to the gym later. But today I would have done CrossFit and then Sunday would have been a 5K, 80% of your mileage. So essentially in each week, it looks like on a CrossFit endurance program, you're only going to do about I don't know, five to six miles, depending on what you're doing. And the whole idea behind CrossFit Endurance is it's a bit different to like the conventional programs. You have those running programs made by this guy called um, Hal Higdon or Hal Hogden. I forgot how you pronounce his name, but just Google it and search around. But he has really comprehensive, comprehensive guides from like 5K all the way to marathons. And for the most part in his programs, you're doing a minimum of like five to 10 miles a week. 
it's just about get, making sure that you're getting yourself out there. There's a common adage you hear a lot from like runner influencers that are runners. Um, when people ask them questions during a Q and A, they be like, "Oh, how do you like motivate yourself to run every day?" Because running, I think, is far more difficult than going to the gym, especially in the morning. Like you know, especially nowadays in this in this season that we're in, you will look out the window at six o'clock in the morning or five a.m. wherever you wake up, and it's pitch black. It's super cold. It's muggy as fuck. Anyone's any people walking around and people that are working, you know, crazy early shifts. So there's hardly anyone on the streets, and it's just you know, it's hard to have motivation to go to the go out and run you can probably travel to the gym because you're gonna know you're gonna be in a warm place somewhere and you're gonna just bang out the exercises or just you know go to your station do your workout and go but the idea of like running on the street you know pounding your your knees and your ankles against the pavement doesn't really fill you with joy so it's quite difficult to do so people ask you know these influencers hey how do you do it day in day out and they always say the thing you have to keep in the front of your mind is that you just want to get outside. As long as you get outside, you're fine. It's very rare that you don't you get outside and you don't run your you don't do your your workout. Like if you decide to do three miles that day, it's unlikely if you just step outside and put your gear on like with your gear on, sorry, that you're not gonna you're just gonna give up after mile one. You're just gonna want to finish it just for your own conviction. So um, that's essentially what that program is like, right? It's about making sure you do five, three to five to ten miles a week on that Hal Higdon program. And you build up your cardiovascular endurance so that when it comes to and then I think by the time you head to race day, it kind of tapers off a little bit. So you kind of go down mileage wise from like, I don't know, maybe eight max, seven max, six, blah, 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 until you get to race day and then you can kind of give your all. But in this program, on this CrossFit Endurance, it kind of focuses more on the mechanics of running as in like making sure your ankles, your hips, your knees are operating at their fullest capacity so you can run better. And then focusing on your running form. I think it's got the pose method of running. The running where like you sort of like, you imagine you're running upright and you sort of like, um, you take your elbows and you pitch them close to your side and you sort of like lean forward. Like imagine like Michael Jackson in that in Smooth Criminal video, right? That kind of lean. And then from that lean, you're using, you're using basically, uh, essentially as you're running, you're using that lean to kind of, using gravity to kind of propel you forward. But then you keep yourself like upright. So it's kind of like a weird little hack that you're doing. Instead of like running up, like it's like on a pogo stick, you see a lot of people running. You're kind of running with a slight knee so that when you're running, you're using gravity and your legs to kind of like motor you along. And obviously you have to keep and make sure your heels touch your bum. Loads of real cool um, little things that I think you should check out. But yeah, that's what I've been doing basically. New Year's Revolution. Long story short, um, that's my plan going forward. And of course, language learning weight loss working out and then everything else on the side is what i'm going to be doing anyway you know like i'm going to make sure that i you know get more bookings this year than i did last year for my djing stuff make sure that i go to the burger four times uh this year too which is going to be great i think the first time i'm going to go to do that is probably february i was meant to go burger at the end of this month january but um something came up last minute so i couldn't do that but i'm going to be in a better financial situation anyway by the end of february to go and really splurge and have some fun and it will be because I meant to go this month because for CTM, but probably better to go for the club night thing they do, right? The club night or knack, how do I pronounce it? So yeah, those are the loose goals, man. That's about it, really. I'm not sure what you guys are doing for your resolutions, but that's me. Um, like I said, I tend to give myself little thirty day experiments anyway all the time, little tweak experiments. I don't really feel like I need to have a new resolution. Like I decide something. The only really hard and fast thing I do is Sober October with everyone else, right? The podcast crew, the whole Joe Rogan family. I do that with those guys. So that's that's only it, really. Apart from that, I try to kind of just run little experiments all the time to make sure I'm at my best self. But yeah, overall, that's it, man. Of course, Junction's coming up as well. That's it, yeah? But anyway, let's get to the show, man. Intro over. As per usual, if it's your first time around here, you'll know that I'm the number one streetwear podcast in the world. The number one. There is no two. There is no three. I am the only one. My name is Agostino. This is called The Exynos English Show, where I collate loads of articles on the interwebs that I find interesting and funny. I put them together in a list, and then we speak about them on the internet, right? Sometimes we run cool clips. Sometimes the stuff that's quite serious. Sometimes it's just me talking about Air Force Ones. Regardless of what it is, if you like what you're hearing and you want to see some more or you want to get recommended it more often, smash that like button, click subscribe to come back another time. And if you want to leave a question, you've got some thoughts and opinions of what I do, make sure you leave a comment down below. If you want to follow me on the whole um, Instagrams and the social medias, you're free to do that too. The Instagrams and social handles you can find in the descriptions. 
It's my name, Agostino Zinga, all one word. You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram under the same um, handle, but you can find the links to my Instagram and my Twitter in the description. If you click the podcast description, if you listen to a video audio, you can see that. And if you're watching via YouTube, click down below. You will see my um, social media thing down there. All right, cool. All right, let's get into it. So much to go into. So I'm going to start with fresh stuff because the old stuff I haven't talked about, I'll go to another episode, but the fresh stuff, yeah? So fresh stuff, number one, and something that I've been um, fascinated with for a long time, and I'm, I'm not sure if everyone else cares about it, but hopefully you guys do, is this very interesting story. So um, are you guys familiar with um, Anna Delvey? So um, Anna Delvey was this um, girl who essentially finagled and scammed a whole bunch of uh, New York socialites out of their money, out of their position, out of their prestige in order to kind of move the, move up the ranks in the fashion world. It all came crumbling down a couple of years ago. They did a big expose about her in the New Yorker, which eventually led to people finding out that she was running a scam. Loads of people that she hadn't paid kind of came up and spoke about the story. And I think eventually she was it's eventually found out because she tried to secure like a multi-million dollar loan in order to kind of open her own foundation, which had involved, you know, dealing with banks, which involved dealing with lawyers. Which essentially rose, it, it, you know, brought some questions to the fore, and then I think as a final act of her desperation, she ended up scamming one of her best friends, quote unquote, right, out of I think nearly sixty thousand dollars or something. So just a complete, you know, scumbag. But when you were, when you read into the story a bit more, and I think I've I've kind of got more information on the story based on this podcast here that's available now on I think on your podcast app, it should be available from the BBC. It's called Fake Hires. And it's a six-part um, podcast series. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the whole ser- of the whole scripted podcast, right? With the voices and shit, for the most part, it, it count me out. I like listening to podcasts where people are talking flagrantly and you know, essentially just going off the see see off their pants. But this is really well produced. They have um, they have a really cool way of weaving the narrative together with these like made up kind of. Um, conversations and dialogues between uh, the kind of Anna Delvey character and her friends which is really nice I quite like how they involved included that and in general it just brings the story to light but I think I was looking at his story and I was thinking about it a bit more and I my initial reaction was like you know this girl's a scumbag doesn't deserve to have friends it kind of falls in the Lena Dunham category for me right the Lena Dunham phenomenon I've never really understood why that lady had such a again it's changed now because of her little oopsies that she's done over the years but I remember when Girls was out, you know, you have to think when someone does, when someone's able to produce a work like Girls, right? She, she writ the show, right? She's, the, I'm pretty sure she's a writer or producer for the show. She created it, right? That's her story, essentially. And I look at Girls for Lena Dunham, even though it might not be true. I haven't looked this up, but I look at Girls as Lena Dunham's first album, right? They say an artist's first album is always amazing because they've had their whole life to, to write it, right? Essentially, um, you've been crafting in your room where no one was listening this sound and then finally when you get the chance to kind of present it to the world of course it's going to sound pretty good but it's the second album and the third album that ones that are going to be a bit tricky so i i think girls was that for her and also i think girls really sp- was a way to her to really get her story out there right kind of put her story on the screen and if you take that to the fore and of course you know it's fiction it's made up it's not real but you look at it you're like huh that character that Lynn and Dunham plays in girls in real life wouldn't necessarily have any friends in it like she's quite a bad friend just pretty disgusting quite self-centered egotistical um lacking in self-awareness just loads of things that you don't really want in an actual friend Uh, um and again i think it transpired that over the years you know she ended up loads of controversy after controversy after controversy and i guess it kind of goes to show just how much of a stinky person she is in real life you know based on the character you see of her playing in girls and i thought the same thing about anna delby but then when i kind of thought about it a bit more i thought you know what I'm quite sympathetic to Lynn and Dunham and this Anna Delvey character because I think in their environment where they kind of grew up, where they were kind of cutting their teeth, where they were trying to establish themselves, make some inroads, that kind of personality is celebrated somewhat. And if, if for the most part, I would I would kind of go as far as saying, I don't think Anna Delvey or um, Lynn and Dunham are that unique or that special within their social group. I'm sure there's other people in their social group who are much more... In, who are way more annoying or grating socially, right? Who are kind of just very difficult to be friends with. I would assume so. And I also, I think the Anna Delvey character, I've got some notes here that I kind of want to span on. I think it just goes to show just how I think similar the fashion industry is to the entertainment industry in this way that no one really, I think outside of being a pattern cutter, right? No one really 
has a skill that can be proven, right? That can be kind of with facts or with experience. Like, hey, I've done this for five years. That means I'm better than you. That's done it for three years. And it, it doesn't exist. Most of entertainment or fashion is kind of built under the premise, I think, or under the illusion that you can kind of get in if you blag it enough, right? If you're able to kind of, you know, finagle, finesse your way in, you can sort of like carve a career for yourself. And we've all got examples of it, right? We've all got friends, people that we know, people that we come across who we're pretty certain, you know, don't really have much upstairs or don't really have much to hand as kind of proof of the quality of their work, but they were able to kind of come about just at the right time, hang in there. And again, it's, it's a case of persistence, right? If you, if you hang around long enough in a subculture or a scene, you will become the authority. I saw it happen with the blogs, right? There were tons of blogs that happened that started when Hypebeast was around. But Hypebeast just stuck with the whole Hypebeast streetwear thing. And then they tend to, and, and then ended up being the go-to, right? The Bible, the sort of like main destination place that people go to to read that kind of news. And that isn't because they're better than anyone else. It's because they just hanged in longer enough. So there's loads of things that happen that kind of rela- that kind of uh, cause people to act a certain way. But you can get sometimes negatively reinforced, right? That can be one thing that happens a lot. Um, and of course, that negative reinforcement in, in general will fuel bullshit, right? It fuels the worst kind of person in your industry. That kind of person that is essentially, you know, <sighs> how, do, how do you describe it? They don't. They're not there for the right reasons, right? The, the, that's the kind of person that is kind of brewing in these kinds of circumstances, I would, I would say. The person that's not there for the right reason, the person that's just there to kind of essentially, um, uh, I don't know, they're, just, they're using it as like a status or a clout thing. I think you heard that a lot from Yana Delvey's story. She thinks she mentioned towards the end that she wasn't in it for the money. It wasn't about scamming people for money. It was about power. It was about influence. It was about clout. It was about um, walking into a room and people kind of freaking out that you're in there and kind of wanting to come over to you and ask you questions. People hitting you up about the parties, all that sort of stuff. That's what she kind of was in it for, right? Um, and in her eyes, from her experience of being in the scene, that was a way to go get to go get it, right? Of course, she went by she went by the kind of crazy way, but some some in some cases it does work. So I don't blame in that regard. And then also, what it goes to show is just her is her canniness really because the story is quite interesting because she gets her inroads or she gets her kind of cosign because she has a short internship working for purple magazine and if you're not familiar purple was a very it still is at the time as i guess in the fashion scene it's very influential but i would say maybe outside of fashion maybe it's kind of run its course but um purple is a is a magazine founded by olivier zam who's you know a very influential person in fashion um kind of the guy that gallivants around town wearing the denim jacket skinny jeans and uh, Chelsea boots and shit with this ABA glasses on all the time. So he runs this um, this uh, magazine called Purple. And I guess for, if you're Anna Delvey, it was a very clever ruse, a very clever tactic to get into the scene because she could have easily decided to go for Vogue, right? ID magazine. Um, I don't know, whatever else, right? Name the big uh, bait magazines out there. But instead, she went the opposite way and decided to go really niche and pick out a magazine that's very well with people in the industry that has a lot of connections whose editor is larger than life someone that you can kind of name drop somewhere because you know unfortunately most people won't be able to name drop the id magazine editor or maybe the original founders probably more so but not editor right or the creative director even no one really give a shit but if you name drop olivier zam you know at a paris fashion week after after party you're most likely going to get a lot more of a favorable response so that was a very clever tactic on on her behalf something that i didn't think uh of actually before i read the story i was like huh because you read it and you're like how did everybody get hoodwinked for so long but then you know if someone comes in with that co-sign into the room into the space right um it's very difficult for you the lowly intern or for you that's also trying to get your way in there to kind of deny them and say nah i think you're trying shit it's very difficult for you to like feel that you have the permission to do so right you're just going to let them carry on even though deep down you think they're definitely chatting shit <laughs> um what else is on here uh the deal oh and at the end i also love that she wasn't sorry she didn't apologize at the end she basically said that you know the game is it is what it is and i have a lot of respect for it you know i have a lot of respect for it because i think so I get, get this sausage out of my mouth um no pause needed uh, i think it's interesting because when i look at the story right hmm, let me see i can do this properly I like how she didn't say sorry because I think for the most part, why should she be sorry? Think about it, right? If fashion is built up on chances, 
I would say for the most part, most people are lying about their experience level, what they've done, um, about their knowledge on a certain subject or about their skill level. It's just they're just plain lying, right? I, I don't I've not met anyone in fashion who's kind of doing it, you know, legit who's doing it kind of, you know, who's kind of s- spoke about the experience in a very black and white kind of vanilla way it's not it's not interesting it's boring right you're gonna you're gonna kind of you know embellish the truth you know and fluff some bits up here and there it's part of the story and it? it's fun um but the but i think for the most part there is also an understanding a subconscious understanding that you're just using this ruse just to get in the door you're not gonna continue being this person you're gonna be the kind of person that's talking is talking about their fucking shoot that you're doing with your friend in the back of your garage like you're doing like you're being commissioned by fucking arena plus home you're gonna do that you're gonna give that impression but you're only doing that because you, you haven't got an in yet. But you're telling yourself, hey, once I get in, I'm going to become a respectable, honest, hardworking, um, straight to the point kind of person, right? I'm, I'm not going to keep, keep up this ruse, this kind of chance of ruse. But there are some people, obviously, that kind of keep it up and continue being the chancer. And, you know, and we know those people. We've seen them around when we're out and about. But I don't think everyone does that. Everyone, for the most part, does uses the kind of chancing thing and line for just to get in. I think her downfall, Anna Delvey, was that she used the chance of thing to get in. And once she realized how easy it was just to finagle it, she didn't. She made no effort to back up her claims. She wanted to open this non-for-profit, you know, uh, charity kind of, you know, creative workspace thing, you know, with a, a shop downstairs, a gallery in the middle, a studio upstairs, you know, that kind of stuff that everyone does, right? Um, but she didn't even try to attempt to kind of hire out a space, do a gallery exhibition, commission some work, whatever she didn't do anything she just essentially continued talking about things which people do in the scene too don't get me wrong you only have to go to a gallery opening you know at protein studio and bump into a couple of old friends and you'll you know be inundated with everyone's fucking projects that they're doing right everyone like it's, it's a constant bane of my life seeing my talented designer friends you know uploading line sheets on instagram or on social media oh look this is a shirt idea i'm thinking about like stop giving me psd files and line sheets like like honestly print the shit it doesn't cost that much if you just stop drinking or stop smoking and shit you could afford a couple of runs of t-shirts that you can just print out for yourself and if you sell one good if you don't sell any no problem it could be part of your portfolio and that, you know what i mean an actual real t-shirt um anyway but that's that's by the point you get that a lot anyway like i said that kind of personality i see it so often that i'm not really that mad about the story I think the story is amazing. Um, so much so now I've read that they're going to option. They've actually optioned the show, um, which is which is cool because I think when you read the story, you get really sad. Or I did anyway for the girl, the friend that's involved that she is eventually scammed at the end. But um, luckily that girl wrote a book, and now that book has been bought out. I think by Netflix or one of these streaming platforms. Uh, another lady who also wrote a story about Anna Delvey had her. I think the original New York Times piece actually it got bought by Netflix to be developed into a show. Um, another kid who was, I think, the bus boy at a hotel she stayed in last, who kind of like ended up being her kind of, you know, friend, quote unquote. He's also been uh, tapped up to be a consultant for a show. So everyone that essentially got ripped off by this woman has essentially uh, got their money back and some. Of course, the turmoil they went through emotionally, physically, mentally is just, you know, you can't, I wouldn't wish I'm my worst enemy, right? I have a situation now at the moment with an old boss who's kind of holding out on paying us unpaid wages. I can only imagine what it must be like when you lend somebody that you think is a Russian oligarch's daughter money and she, you know, essentially kind of fucks you over and never apologizes. It can, it can be awful. But I, I love the fact that there's some sort of silver lining in the story and that these people are being, you know, kind of supported and they're being looked after by the entertainment industry. Cause it doesn't always happen that way. And of course, for some way, some may say, oh, it's, it's horrible anyway, because why is she getting, why is um, Anna Delvey getting any kind of praise, right? Why is she even getting the option to kind of, you know, be able to have a show or to even have this, have be a consultant? Unfortunately, this is the way the, the world works, isn't it? Same way that how when 6 9 comes out, he'll be a bigger star than he was when he went in. Unfortunately, we can't really do anything about that. Um, let me get something else up here before we move on. What's we got here that I want to talk about? Let me get these notes on my thing and see if this works. Preserve folder and input. What am I doing? Okay, let's put this here. Let's get this new. See if this works. Bear with me one second. You just quickly download these. Fucking okay, no. okay, nope. Okay, cool. We're back. Right, we're back. We're back on now. Let's see if we can get this up there. Why is it doing that? 
Uh, I'm trying to load this up. It's not really working well. Let's see if I can find it. One PDF. Where's the rest of it? Okay, quit. I'm trying to see if I can open this. Can you open things on notes? You can't. Can you share? Import two notes. Export as PDF. What's import two notes? What's this? Does this work? Oh, so hard. All right, cool. Let's just look. I'm going to load this up on my um, Google Docs because I've got stuff I want to talk about, but I don't want to get it up on here. Let's see if I can open up my Google Docs, actually. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Bear with me a second while I get this up. Let me see if I can find this. Okay, let's go to new. Oh, file upload. Bear with me, don't leave. Okay, here's the timestamps of what stuff I want to talk about. Uploaded. Okay, cool. <laughs> Open with Google Docs. Cool. Boom, we're done. Finally. Okay. So let's move on. Anna Delvey, we spoke about that already. What's the next topic I want to go through here? Oh, social media is taking over supposedly um but we should know this already this is a cool little story from mix mag actually um talking about the importance of social media at festivals which i thought was quite cool let's quickly read this article and we can continue on um it spoke about the stuff you'd see i think um someone posted a video of it last year didn't they of uh coachella being the social media content farm <laughs> there's loads of people out in coachella just like you know um, taking pictures of themselves and it just, I think someone basically took a picture of everyone else taking a picture of themselves at the same time. And it looked fucking super dystopian. Really, really freaky. Um, I'm going to get this topic up now. I'm going to show you the video actually where I can find it here. It's this one in it, right? Oh, is that there? You will find it in a minute. Why is this? What's happening here? Why is this not loading? Okay, let's go and mix mag anyway. I don't know why it's not loading. But anyway, let's get it up on here. Why is nothing working today? Mm -mm -mm. One second, bear with me whilst I find this features. Ay ay ay. So if I just go like that, right, and I copy that, and I go here, what happens there? Okay, that's not happening. Cool. What's happening there? I don't know. Well done. Cool. Boom. Let's put this right. You got this? All right, we're back. Jesus Christ, man. Sorry, I'm a little bit rusty. You know, it's been a while since I've been podding, so I'm a little bit rusty. Please bear with me. So, going back to the topic. Mix Mike had this excellent article discussing uh, the importance of Instagram in the whole electronic music space, dance music space, whatever you may call it. It's titled Mix Mike. Oh, sorry, it's titled Instagram Reality. Um, again, I'm a fan of the articles Mixbag put up, so I recommend you check it out if you're a fan of dance music. So this is an article here. says so the following. Um, the culture phenomenon of the post-decade is changing the way festivals and clubs are designed. How Instagram is changing the design of our clubs and festivals now is the summer of our disco content. Um, I've seen it myself. I think having worked briefly for a company that was doing festival tickets, I saw how important social media was to the companies that are pushing the festivals. Obviously for sales, for exposure, for interest, whatever it may be. Maybe even sometimes for brand sponsorships or partnerships further down the line. I liked their approach. Um, I thought it was all cool, no problem. But also, I think the prevalence of social media at festivals um, has been noted and also something that was inevitable. I think if you're a festival organizer, uh, promoter, planner, you had to realize that there was a dearth of new people coming into festivals. I think the old school festival type people who knew about festivals from back in the day and weren't really trying to share the secret had kind of aged themselves out of the scene naturally. So uh, promoters had to basically um, cultivate a whole new audience. And the only way to do that was to kind of tap into the social, native, younger, um, you know, um, post-millennial generation out there, right? And they care a lot about being seen at places as opposed to just going and enjoying them, right? So with that being said, you had to create spaces where they could essentially uh, become your ad hoc influencers and ambassadors for your... Uh, festival, why are they paying you to attend? It's pretty clever if you think about it, right? Because 
they could spend 20 grand on an influencer and tell them to come take some pictures but they could also get you know thousands and maybe close to millions of pounds worth of exposure for free for people to actually attending the event if they have some really cool backdrops and places with their branding on it that people can take pictures at right and especially some really iconic stuff i think of wireless i think of love box um i think of love park i think of um so many dimension man first of all i have the little kind of backdrop place where you can kind of take a picture of yeah and i even think of places like Bergheim, which is probably not the best place to do those kind of things because they don't necessarily let you take pictures but how many images have you seen of people standing on that little walkway up towards the Bergheim with the Bergheim in the background towards it because obviously there's nothing near the Bergheim. it was an ex-power plant so it's pretty sparse around the kind of surrounding areas so any angle you take that picture at the one thing that's dominating the, the frame is this big gargantuan you know rectangle concrete box right or the square concrete box that's the only thing that's that's kind of uh showing you that you've kind of been there even the wristband won't do so that's kind of a, a weird little backdrop thing and that's worked really well so i don't really mind it i think for the most part the festivals that do it the most are the ones that probably i probably won't end up going to anyway and i think they attract a certain audience but again if you're comfortable with that audience and you don't mind then i have, I have no problem with it because most of those designated social media spots are way away are very much away from the actual stage people can dance it gets a bit annoying sometimes when you watch certain people or you go to certain festivals when everyone has their phone out recording that can be a bit weird because you're trying to get an angle and then everyone's blocking you because of their arms and their phones that can get very frustrating and of course you don't want to bump anyone you don't want them to drop their phone so just built up a lot of stress a lot bit of anxiety and not of the most um you know carefree kind of environment which festivals should be really you should be worrying about what you look like on your phone but you know what can you do so go back to the article how is the going to change the design of clubs and festivals <laughs> written by duncan dick I'm not sure if that's actually his real name but if it is big up you uh we're weaving our way through a dusty field there are palm trees on the horizon low slung tents to the right and space age arch huge dome to the left at one point a ferris wheels uh fills the sky crowded with 20 somethings and cut-ups and leggings of vintage style dresses and sunglasses this is a clearly a main furrow a main furrow thoroughfare whatever it's called right but not everyone is on the way somewhere we see first one we see the first one then two then three people standing if frozen to a spot by a rave gorgon <laughs> one foot in front of the other hand on hip head cocked to one side and a friend with a phone kneeling or crouching a few feet in front of them like some kind of pen um, pentinent we pass another of these uh, tableau then another yet more pairs crowded over the phone to check angles and lighting the 26 second clip is from ready the post is by this guy here. So I think this is the Reddit one, right? This is the famous clip from Reddit that shows um, uh, Coachella being a content farm that it is, which again, I have no real issue with. I don't really mind it personally, but I think the video itself is pretty, pretty funny. Um, so here's a video here. Get that up and see if it shows here. But it essentially just shows these young girls just as they're walking towards Coachella. They just basically just got in. You know that kind of festival buzz and they're all just standing around taking pictures of each other. I'll describe it to you if you listen to the podcast episode. People are literally on their phone in this amazing festival, right? Where they should be having loads of fun. You know, the, the boyfriend here having to take a million angles of his girlfriend with the pictures of her crossing her legs, pointing upwards. <laughs> Girls in jean shorts. Everyone doing pictures. Everyone, right? That fucking foot in front. That one foot in front with a toe down, with a heel up off the floor is a, such an infuriating pose no one i repeat no one looks good it doesn't look natural it doesn't make your leg look less skinny or whatever it may be that kind of angles thing it's all a lie and they're just doing it to be sheep but yeah anyway let's go back to the article <laughs> um blah blah um so i guess so the cat continues uh, the pack knows knows normally knows better explains uh seal krakow of the university of copenhagen a leading international expert in how environmental design can be used to nudge behavior and uh, psychology if you stick with them you are safer we take cues and cognitive triggers from the environment and what the people around us are doing. And this is called the bandwagon bias. Something that I've kind of been very against from the onset. Like I think for the moment, I'm, I kind of realized what was going on around me and you're conscious of the way people kind of act and kind of just follow things because everyone else is doing it because it's cool. I now make a conscious effort. As soon as something starts to get too cool or people start to bandwagon something, I just jump off. I don't, I don't, do, I, don't I don't oppose it. I don't uh, do the contrarian thing and jump on the other opposing opinion or view of product or services bandwagon. I don't do that. I just jump off. Just in classic hipster fashion, I just jump off. I refuse to go go again. It's not it's not for me. Um, again, because I don't I don't want to be that person that's ruining someone's fun, but also don't want to subject myself to this kind of you know 
um, everyday average Joe kind of nonsense and everyone else is jumping on. That's not what. That's not the life that I want to live. I get one shot at this life, one really short window to enjoy my time on this planet. And the last thing I'm going to be doing is following people around and asking for their recommendations and shit. Nah. <laughs> Um, it's the reason uh, so it continues it's the reason she explains that subconsciously we follow the crowd when you step off the airplane and the reason why Netflix tells you what's the most popular with everyone else when the series finishes Netflix the, the airplane one is a bad example I think the Escalade is a better example Escalades I tend to always take the one that no one else has taken I think you see a lot at Liverpool Street Station they've got like three or sometimes two Escalades that go up and if everyone else is going that one onto the one on the right I'll go to the one on the left just, just because I, I want to be a bit different and the Netflix suggestions thing I don't think I've ever watched anything on Netflix that was suggested to me. Oh, people that watch this also like that. I don't give a fuck what everyone likes. I go and watch stuff on Netflix that I get recommended by other people who I trust their opinion on TV, right? I don't just recommend what everyone else is watching in the everyday public. I don't care. Uh, again, but that's me. I'm, I'm different. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it continues here. It's why when you see crowds of people taking a selfie and they're going for the gram, you feel the urge to join in. Nope. You just walk by and continue doing it stuff. On an individual level, she says the psychological impulses that Instagram uses triggers from bandwagon bias to the uh, dopamine reward of the like to loss aversion. Broadly, this psychological term for it is FOMO, right? Our myriad. Uh, not all surprising to its creators. The main reason it has become such a, a huge phenomenon. Uh, for some people, it can quickly become part of their system. I behavior, system one behavior, sorry, the unconscious routines and instincts that guide 90% of our decisions. Uh, the Roman Empire is needed. Let's continue on, blah, blah, blah. So this is loads of pictures of people at Coachella doing the same pretty much pose in front of that massive Ferris wall, right? Everyone's got the same sort of picture. And to be fair to Coachella, they designed that fucking Ferris wall really well. Uh, maybe it's a setting that it's in, the landscape, but in everyone's frame is essentially dominating the entire background of the frame, right? And if you're very clever and you know how to use your angles, you can get a good picture of even if it's really busy there. So that's a very, very big win in terms of marketing, right? So great on them. Um, in terms of growth, the biggest clubbing success story of the past decade is Elro, right? Let me just quickly blow my nose because I'm sniffing way too much here. I should have actually used my... My fucking um, inhaler, but hey, what can you do? So it says here, the biggest, uh, the one in the biggest terms of growth is Elro, which I, I agree with. I think I remember when I started working for that ticketing company, Elro was, you know, I, yeah, when I worked at a ticketing company, I think I realized just how big Elro was. I just wrongly assumed that it was just, you know, a little, not a little operation that ran outside, ran mostly, mostly in the UK and in Europe. But mate, they've got. Elro's popping up literally everywhere, right? And they all sort of like run on their own or some shit. I don't know how they do them. You can essentially go to Elro kind of all year round, then if you want to, right? Um, once just as once it was just an eccentric family-run club in a dusty countryside outside of Barcelona, it's now a world trading, which I like actually. It's a family-run operation, and I'm pretty sure. I remember watching an interview with the son that sort of like taken over. I think one of the sons, I think it was maybe on IMS Ibiza. He did a little panel discussion. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the bus is now washed around a mega brand with residencies in Ibiza to Vegas and events from Jakarta to Manchester with an average attendee of age of 23. I'll give you the main reason for this exponential success is the way that Elro has harnessed the power of social media to spread the word about. Of course, they have a really good stage show. Um, again, something I wouldn't necessarily want to go to myself, but I think objectively, they do really good stage design, right? If you see here, Elro, uh, let's see, this right stage, right? The stage DJ booth is really cool. Sometimes they have dancers and they're really kind of naff, I beef away. But I think visually, if you're going to go to a festival, right? Imagine you went to a festival and you saw this sort of stuff, like glaring at you as you're looking up at the DJ and wondering, oh, how do I get behind that booth? Look at that. Confetti everywhere. You've got these acrobats swinging off the rafters, lights, fireworks. Like they go ham. It's sort of similar to Tomorrowland. Again, not something I would go to myself, um, you know, not necessarily my kind of music but you have to kind of salute and give kind of props to the stage design and the the, the, the money that goes into the production of that festival because i remember watching a video of this bodybuilder walking around um tomorrow and i didn't know how big the flipping site was there's whole restaurants there spas massage parlors like it's in it's especially built a little village little town uh, for when Tomorrowland comes around. So you can, you can only imagine how much that must cost for a company like them. And even if they're getting kickbacks and deals and stuff, it's still a lot of money. They could make a, probably a lot more if they just put a stage, one stage up, some screens and a, and a table and let DJs 
that, you know and imagine just the booking fees alone so they're probably not making that much money on that festival so for them to do that just for the love and just for the experience and just to kind of separate yourself from everyone else in the pack and say now nah, we're a different breed that's amazing so yeah big up Elra because again like I said in terms of if you went to like a UK or London festival there this is quite norm right every kind of every other festival has a really good a really nerdy enthusiastic person who gives a shit about the culture producing stuff like this and going the extra mile you know curate i mean producing the space um designing it making it a bit special but of course you're used to festivals where they just have it in the field with some speakers right it, this can seem weird but for me it's not that big of a deal but again i think in the space that they operate in it's really amazing um marketers call it so this um i'll give you the main reason it's um the exponential success is the way they operate high on social media and more importantly the pictures of their multicolored spectaculars marketers call this peer-to-peer -peer, turning your customers into salespeople, which i mentioned you earlier right david jordan's achieved um revenue of of elro he basically said i'm in charge of everything that brings in revenue in but mainly i'm in charge of the marketing which is weird isn't it why would you have somebody that's in charge of marketing, charge of revenue? But if you think about it closely, marketing should really be making you money, right? That's the whole reason why you do marketing. But I don't know, for me, because I'm so jaded, you've been involved in startups too much and I've been involved in too many kind of sceny, cool streetwear things where marketing is sort of like a, a brand exercise just for you to kind of promote yourself or to kind of get your get your get get the word out there, right? <laughs> Let yourself be seen. But the real point of marketing was essentially to kind of, you know, garner some attention or kind of some, you know, some eyeballs to the thing that you're making in the hope to, to convert that into sales. That was the whole point of it. Um, I like what they're going back to that kind of roots, right? Um, Jordan's background is in online advertising, which makes sense, a bit different from marketing, and he is keenly aware of how important Instagram is to our success. He says, in the last five or six months, it has come, it become crucial. Rah, it's even soon, it's even more recent than I imagined. Because I really did, honestly, I remember when I started a ticket company, Elro was big, but it wasn't as, it just seemed to like, I don't know, over the last few months, it just, gone up like a rocket mate um he said here yeah, 90 percent of our ticket sales are online and all our branding and investment goes online and on top of what we do uh, on our own channels instagram today is where our users are sharing Elro. Elro says that david Elro sa uh, says david um, is able to calculate how much this user generated marketing is worth and he puts the average at somewhere around hundred thousand euros per show unsurprisingly this means that when we prepare a new event or a new animation or activation the first thing we think about is how it's going to look like on instagram which is fair isn't it i understand that um an error an early adopter of setting up areas of mirrors or games that work as selfie prop which is awesome that's the really cool thing to do i think now especially if you've got a business i think there's a few restaurants i've seen online there's like what's that is, is it a pink is it a cafe is a shop it's like a cafe i think in central london i'm gonna say soho or i'm gonna say chelsea somewhere around central london where they have this amazing amazing interior and they have really cool outside area too whoever founded that coffee shop whatever it's called bravo to you they have a really cool interior loads of really cool sort of like a um, neon uh signage inside mirrored walls some cool sort of like flowers on the outside i think it's i think it's pink but again something that you have to kind of keep in consideration when you're running your business nowadays it's just one of the things and again it's an easy win isn't it if you're good on social media and you actually have the knack for it why not um it continues here but it's but it's long mastered the art of integrating instagram into experience it's organic and authentic it feels as natural as dancing one vivid example is the paint used for his epic underwater themed uh Ro Madas main stage in a picture the texture looks wet it looks amazing it's like coming from the sea expanded jordan indeed his designers have not just created an environment that's instagram friendly they've centered the sort of augmented reality you can't really see the texture in real life only in the photograph he marvels oh wow that's pretty cool isn't it Instead of seeing, yeah, I like that idea. In the, in the middle of a DJ set, you could have a moment where a character opens a door to another dimension. A lot of characters, like from science fiction movies in the 80s, go through the dance floor and everywhere, not on stage, but in the middle of everyone. These moments work as handy cues to focus shareable, shareable hyper-photogenic moments to the crowd. The genius of error is turning something that could be passive, taking a picture, into something interactive and immersive. Focusing it via narrative into specific moments also helps to maintain immersion the rest of the night the animations mean you don't just have people going on safari with their phones all night as you impossible which makes sense isn't it really i like that so in a weird way even though they've got a lot more props up there people tend to kind of like take the picture share on social and then just enjoy themselves in the moment around all this wacky shit which is pretty cool you wouldn't think that you'd think with all the distractions that people just be on their phone all the time but i don't think that's necessarily the case um 
As creative director of the Vibration Group, Simon Aldred has overseen the design of two of the most important new cultural spaces in Europe the past decade, Printworks and the Warehouse Project in Manchester. Um, his background in festivals design means he visualizes his events in these found, reclaimed, converted industrial spaces as indoor festivals. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. That explains a lot about Printworks and the production that goes into it. That's interesting, isn't it? Thinking of a club as an indoor festival as opposed to a night because it's not a nightclub right a nightclub i would say what do you say a nightclub is by definition if you had to define a nightclub by definition in, define it in terms of capacity i would say a nightclub is somewhere where maximum 500 people i wouldn't say more than that is too much it's not really a nightclub right it's, it's something more than a nightclub i think 500 people is probably a nightclub and i guess somewhere somewhere dark right no windows maybe a basement somewhere or whatever that would be a nightclub too because there's places that are kind of clubby, but not really. There's more seats and, and predominantly where 90% of the square footage is made up of just the dance floor. No seats or anything. I think that's a nightclub. Anything else is just like fake. I would say so, right? Um, but yeah, that's a very cool way to think about it. Wow, clever, isn't it? No wonder these guys get paid the big bucks to design these spaces. <laughs> um, um, he says it's... Um, da, 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 da. And has enabled him to both respond to and shape the changes in the UK clubbing behavior. He says, currently, the sound is absolutely the first thing we think about. Of course, you have to do that. Especially if you're using a reclaimed spot, you have to kind of take advantage of some of the kind of, you know, leniencies you might get with the sound police, I'd say, maybe, right? Uh, but definitely, um, but I definitely uh, recognize that we do think about visuals, touch points through the venue. When it, when, even if it's as simple as light boxes that say drinks and a giant print works light box, we all know that girls and boys are going to stand in front of it and do that thing where they kneel down and do the group shot. Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. That's amazing. <laughs> Different. I like how he speaks about it. Like he, he half despises it, but also knows the game is a game. These guys keep me employed. They keep the club full. They drink, they buy drinks, they have a dance and they go home. You know, you can't be mad at that, right? Different nights and audiences, though, have different priorities. And Aldred wonders whether audiences for the Hydra, the external promoters who run Primo's Factory Underground Night, booking outside Jeff Mills and Helen Hel Hel Huff, give a damn about it. No, they don't, right? Just true. Good point. Probably not. The Hydra audience would just be interested in the music and the DJ and the sound, but Instagram absolutely affects the design of the spaces. If not initially, it evolves. It's not a priority for us, but more and more in any conversation, someone will go, well, the audience say photographs, which I like. I guess if you're going to be smart about it, you might be it, it might be beneficial to kind of give to put all the bells and whistles on the night when it's kind of I don't know someone like a script or something where the audience might be more conscious about sharing stuff online and then have uh, some spaces that are not kind of modular places that you always kind of light up and just leave them there for the night side of the hydro or maybe allow the hydro to come in and put a, imagine if you got like a light box with like the Printworks logo they could just come in take off that screen and put their logo on it or maybe put some logos of the djs that are promoting that might be quite cool or just strip it down i don't think that's that that should be that much of a problem but again i like this idea that there's no middle ground there has to be you have to decide who you're kind of aiming towards and then just kind of double down on it i look at somewhere like a grease muller and look at somewhere like a trezor right two completely different audiences i say go to those kind of clubs when you go to berlin um but they really double down on the audience that they're after right grease muller kind of looks like the people that go to grease muller and they're really focusing on that group. Trezor is the same, right? They're really focusing on that kind of um, techno tourist that's going to come into town. And they make that night special for them. Um, and I like all that. Uh, and it continues here. Um, the nature of social media means that Aldred and his team are able to track in real time which areas of space have become hotspots. Wow. Yeah, you just got to go on social and you see how many pictures people are taking on that area, right? You see a lot with um, Fold. Even if Fold don't like a lot of pictures, you know, that that bloody, those, um that kind of perforated, window thing with all the light shines through and they decided to put some screens on there it was a fucking genius step so you'd always see people taking pictures of there over the weekend um we're aware we are aware there are probably eight or nine oh so okay as you as you first go into print works there's a giant sign that uh, did create a bottleneck for pictures so we moved that to an area where the people can use the backdrop nice we're very aware that there are probably eight to nine spots in print works for instance where people first go in the money shot of all the motors in the courtyard have a big signage that says print works sick and we're seeing some more groups standing in the black 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 corridor outside as you first come in but if i'm honest these spots are kind of adopted by the people if you know what i mean things we just thought were nicer their core pieces are now being adopted as little icons of print works but i guess now we know what we become and we probably are amplifying that a little bit uh, da, da, da. uh with depot which opened in the year converted train station address team were able to apply that what they learned to find spaces confirmed from scratch the big learning from print works was that 
where there's a massive room, we've kept the room massive. Oh yeah, that's what I like about. It. That's a good point. The good, good, good. Um, I, I, these interviews are fucking awesome. I love finding out stuff about the scene. So interesting. So I, that's what I liked about the warehouse. Have you seen the images of the warehouse project in Manchester, the depot? It just looks very sparse because the ceilings are fucking high, way, 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 way up there. Um, and it, sometimes I think the first time you see it, it kind of fucks with your head, right? Um, the warehouse project. Uh, Manchester Depot, right? It really fucks with your head when you see it for the first time. Because you think, oh, there should be something filling that, right? There should be, I don't know, like a net or something you might see in that beef. I don't know, something. There should be something you, you feel about it. But then the more you the more you look at it, the more you kind of keep abreast of it, the more you're like, ah, no, no, no. This is absolutely perfect. This video of like Nina Kravitz playing um, at the Apex Twin party on her, on her Instagram is a good example of it, right? Look how look look at look at how high that ceiling is, right? I know that this is it's flashing and stuff. Let me try to get up here on the screen. But look how high the ceiling is, and look how dark it is too. The only thing illuminating from that whole room is the CDJs and the lights, the LEDs that are running currently around the whole space. But I like how they just, you know what I mean? And I also would think, imagine right, if they were able to somehow um, find a solution where they essentially. Uh, made it similar to Bergheim where because I think the Bergheim booth you can't even see it when you're in the main floor I swear to god yeah maybe you can no you can when the closer you get up to because usually I'm at the back where the kind of plinths are right so imagine if they kind of created a scene where they kind of essentially um put a screen in front of the DJ booth or kind of lower the booth a little bit so that no one could see where the booth was and it kind of was yeah you know that'd be really cool this is disorientating if like you create these little false DJ spots where like you had like performers or silhouettes kind of moving side to side pretend like they're DJing but they're not and he's just all around the space and he didn't know where the DJ was and then he just popped up in the middle of the, middle of the room like a wrestler like ah! <laughs> maybe not I don't know but yeah I, I love that I didn't really think I didn't think that was purposeful uh, I just thought they just didn't know what to do with the space but again that's very very intriguing that's all really purposely done like just keep it completely sparse but yeah go back to the interview um da -da -da -da. Keep it massive to make sure that everyone gets that experience, that epic wow, that total immersive sound. But then obviously acknowledging the fact that everyone is going to get their phone up immediately. Aldrin is looking, okay, so it's um, give and take. At the depot, there's a giant set of original yellow doors, which I suspect will become icons. Once we know what people want to share, I guess we'll make it easier for people to share them. Oh, sick. Awesome. I like, I like their approach. And of course, they've got some images here of the epic, the iconic Berghain um picture that people take i've never taken one i just feel a bit cringy i usually take a picture of my wristband or something or the stamp i think that's a bit more authentic but everyone does that picture it's usually i think it's more it should be more reserved for people that go there for the first time i think first time especially if you finally get into the Bergheim after years of trying i think you're allowed to kind of go in front of the burger and take that kind of selfie no problem or someone to take it for you but i think if you've been there a few times it's a bit cringe to do it i've been there you know probably more times i've been to fabric so no and i also think it's really advantageous to go there when you when you, when you do a gig right because this is our comedy store you know the comedy store in la that all the comedians love and they kind of wank over and they all want to get spots there this is our version of it if you're a techno infuser so if you, even if you're just a fan or even if you even if you're a dj like myself up and coming you're trying to make your way through i think just getting in there is a big deal so i think if you're a comedy fan you like all these podcasters right and you finally get to the comedy store you're probably gonna take a picture of yourself you know standing in front of the comedy store sign up in front of the flipping set list but i think if you've been there a couple of times after that fact it's not it doesn't really have the same sort of punch but again i, I think it's all cool I, but it's even more cooler because the burgine is notoriously against social media right so for them to kind of um fall into this social media um kind of uh, drive activation just by proxy of like what the building looks like and the fact that they haven't changed it because you know somebody else would that's the thing i like about some places too but they just don't change shit right they just, they just keep repeating the same thing that's worked for them they don't try and fuck around with the, with the, with the recipe or try and add some lights to it. It's just, no, this is works. So we're just going to keep it. Like the burger on the same. Just kept the decor exactly the same. Change some stuff around here and there. I think Panorama Bar doesn't have those hanging speakers, hanging, suspending by chains anymore. Uh, they've now changed. But for the most part, it's relatively the same, right? If you went in the 90s, you've got it now. You won't be shocked and, you know, appalled by what's going on in there. Um, but yeah, interesting article, man. I recommend you check it out. Um, there's a lot in there to read. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long. But definitely check it out. It's titled uh, Instagram Reality. Loads of really cool Insta bits in there. The cultural phenomenon of the past decade is changing the way festivals and clubs are designed. Available now on the old Mix Mac. Anyways, move on, move on, move on, move on. Let's get out of here. What else is on the list I want to talk about here? Uh... 
Mm-hmm. Oh, um, there's a really cool interview here with um, Rich Roll. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. Rich Roll did a really cool little interview that I thought was of interest, especially going into this whole new year, sort of new me kind of wave. Um, Rich Roll is a guru of reinvention. It's via a magazine called Outside. And I think he was basically speaking about um, the need to kind of reinvent yourself every decade or all the time in general, especially the older you become, right? To not think you're kind of at a fixed spot and that you're not going to progress or get better at what you do and kind of making those changes going forward. So um, the title is titled Rich Roll is a Guru of Reinvention, where how he overcame addiction, work, uh, workaholism to become an elite enjoyed athlete and star podcast host. As he sees it, it's never too late to start over and path and uh, more balanced life, right? And he's wearing obviously his cool outfit there. Got his sunglasses on a cool little Nike top. So, and this is the following. Um, in October 2018, just before his 52nd birthday, um, Enjoyous Athlete and podcast host Rich Roll offered the short version of his life story on Twitter. Um, I didn't reach my athletic peak until I was 43. I didn't write my first book until I was 44. I didn't start my podcast until I was 45. At 30, I thought my life was over. 52, I know it's just the beginning. Keep running, never give up, and watch your, your kite soar. He ended with two emojis. A hand given peace sign and a plant emoji. So, um, which I agree with, right? I think, I don't know, man, it's hard sometimes. I think most of the reason why people get in a slump or get a bit discouraged mostly is to do with social media, unfortunately. I think so. I think social media has, is not the problem, but it's the cause of some issues. It kind of ex expedites your knowledge of other people's lives. I think back in the day, you still would have had envy and jealousy as emotions when you see someone else doing something that you want to do it would have still existed but it would have been delayed right you would have found out about it a couple of days later or a week later and it wouldn't have hurt as much but i think when you're instantly seeing your friends or people that you deem as your online friends doing cool and interesting things and you're just laboring around and not really making any changes and nothing's really progressing and you feel as if you're not kind of making any you know because i think humans are not we're not very good at noticing incremental steps we're only good at noticing like really big kabooms right oh the oven that's why people obsess with overnight successes right because no one really notices that if you practice i don't know if you couldn't do one push-up and you started doing one a day and then by week two you could end up doing two a day you wouldn't notice that you'd only notice that you could do 50 or 100 but you wouldn't notice that literally the last week you couldn't do one and now you're doing two that's double right you wouldn't that wouldn't be an achievement i think it was just how we're hardwired so I think social media does that. It kind of aids that and it kind of does, it doesn't help that way of thinking. Um, but I think for the most part, I think deep down we're all aware that it's not it's not by chance things happen for some people. When you read their story and you find out how long they've been in the game, what they've been doing, um, the things that they sacrificed, all these things, you can think, you, there's no one that you look at and say they're undeserving. There are a few people, don't get me wrong, they do exist. But for the most part, most people aren't undeserving successes. They're usually deserving of their success, even if you don't like what they're doing, even if you don't like them as a person. Um, but again, I just think with social media, it's very hard to kind of get that perspective. It's very hard to have patience too, to say, you know what, I'm going to do this for like, I think comedy is the best example. I always, always use it because I listen to so many comedy podcasts, but they always say it every time, especially Joey Diaz. They always say, which probably puts me off even doing stand-up in the first place, to be completely honest. They always say, you have to be in the game for 10 years just to be good. You have to do stand-up for 10 years consecutively just to get to a level where you're good. Not amazing, not enough to have a special or to have a own podcast or to make money, just to be good, just to be funny. That, so other comedians think you're funny, which is what people, which is what comedians really value, which is really cool, I think, for the most part. The most important thing for comedians is the fact that they're able to kind of have the respect of their peers. I think other industries aren't like that. I think other industries sort of, they kind of insulate themselves for the most part. Uh, uh, um, they kind of insulate themselves with success and money and shit. So, and and there's no one really calling people out. So you see a lot with Seth Troxler and the whole debate he had with Camel Fat, right? That doesn't really happen in electronic music. People just kind of let each other do what they want to do, isn't it, right? And I guess within the kind of people that get it and are really about the culture, they can be, oh, that guy's a knob. That guy's not doing it for the right reasons. Cool. But for the most part, if you've got money, you can kind of distance yourself from criticism. But comedy isn't like that. Comedy is like, you have to be funny. And if you're not funny, no one cares. So they say just to be funny is, is 10 years. So there's a, there's a kind of real understanding in the comedy community that, you know, there's no rush. It doesn't mean because this girl got her new Netflix show that you're going to get yours tomorrow. Even if you start at the same time, there is no rush. You just have to be funny first. Um, I like that. So anyway, continue on with the article. Um, if this kind of self-help poetry makes you squirm, 
He's probably not among the Marabin fans of Ritual podcast, which I'm a big fan of. I love his book too. It's really cool. That's a book that should be made into a movie, man. Ritual's book. That's a really average Joe story, right? Him becoming a lawyer, falling out of love with that, and then suddenly, you know, deciding to run an ultra marathon by mistake, right? In Hawaii and shit. Madness, right? Um, which is one of the most popular interview shows in the world with 68 million downloads and counting. Mamma mia. In an era of high pace, everything and outsized personalities, his appeal uh, and his patience of humble inquisitiveness. Um, he guests range from the elite athletes like Alex Hol- Alex um, Honnold, sorry, Olympic triathletes um, Gwen Jorgensen to meditation acolytes, Twitter founder Jack Dorsey and comedian Russell Brand to spiritual leaders and whatever. To everyone from Rich Roll, uh, he's an unrushed and caring, an entrepreneur and health life coach, Jesse Eitzler, who's famous for doing that thing with um, David Goggins, really, where he kind of trained him like a Navy SEAL. He said that oh, he's like the endurance athlete version of Oprah. Roll's approach grows out of the personal journey he outlined in the tweet. He has a talented swimmer at Stanford, but develops an alcohol problem that later ended up destroying his first marriage during the honeymoon and nearly derailed his career as an entertainment lawyer. He sobered up after his stint and rehab, then became workaholic, spending the next decade rolling towards burnout. It's funny, you know, that that kind of type A personality, that's what they always do. I, I've noticed I do that too. When you get too crazy, you tend to kind of double down on your work, right? And then he kind of went the next decade uh, toiling towards burnout. At the age of 40, realizing he was miserable, he suddenly was unhealthy. He decided to start endurance training. Like, you just go hard in the paint. He's, you know, he ends up wrecking his first marriage because he drinks too much, gets completely sober, then becomes, you know, an A-star lawyer, but gets completely wrapped up in work and doesn't go home. And then to kind of in- introduce some balance, he decides to do endurance training. Instead of just running a 5K in the park, he wants to do an ultra marathon. It's just like, you know, that's an addict personality isn't it? or type A personality. You just, you just go full ham. Um, two years later, he finished with the ultra marathon, an infamous three day swim back run, uh, Sir Sufferest in Hawaii. He, he wrote a book about his transformation in 2012's Finding Ultra, an amazing book, quitting his job, started recording a conversation on podcasts. Back then, nobody listens to him. Now, lots of people do, mostly because of nobody does a better job of helping us understand how we can improve our lives by uh, being more patient and less well maxed out. Um, what well, is here? These are some quotes I thought were interesting from here, right? Um, so, um, what happened? What happens in the se- in secret society rooms of addiction recovery stays there. He says, right. What I can say is that you become a skilled listener. You develop a huge capacity for empathy, and you learn how to be vulnerable. It's not a mistake that a lot of successful people in podcasting hosts are in recovery, which is very true. You see, you know, for the most part, most of them have a really good understanding of listening. And it's really strange how most podcasters are better interviewers than most people you find on TV. Of course, the TV format you can't blame a someone like a James Corden being, you know, a terrible interviewer because. The format kind of calls for him to get his main juice of his questions in a 15 minutes or 40 minute segment before the breaks come on again. Um, so that is one of them. But I just think there's frequency, right? Being able to do like 17 shows in one day, right? Or five podcast episodes in one week and continue to churn them out. You're essentially going to get better and better as a host. And you're going to find out what listeners want to hear, what they don't want to hear. And it's just going to continue going on and on from there. So I'm not surprised that. It's very rare you get a podcast host as a really shit interviewer. The only one I can think of is probably Gary Vee. Because he just, you know, he doesn't let he doesn't let anyone finish any of the questions. But because his mind is always racing at 100 knots per hour, isn't it? Um, but that's the only one I can think of. Like, but he's not really an interviewer, I would say, as well in that regard. Um, he says, I don't think myself in the world's industry. I just think of myself as following my curiosity. He says, when I got sober, I was intent on becoming a, a productive member of society. I repaired my relationship with my family, my friends. I became successful with a corporate lawyer. I drove a sports car and lived in a very nice house. From the outside, it looked all groovy. But on the inside, I was becoming, I was coming to terms with the fact that I was chasing someone else's life. Wow. Yeah, true. Very, very true. Um, I'm constantly spreading the myth that I am some sort of crazy gifted actually in my first half marathon i bathed during the swim by the time i got off my bike my legs were so cramped up that i ran 100 meters and i stopped it was a is a dnf that did not finish my beginnings in triathlon were very humble but i loved it so yeah i really reckon you check it out man it's a really cool article again just i just love this first bit here the, the idea that you know not everything comes to us pre-packaged not everything comes to us quickly sometimes things do take some time and again you know this is part of life, man. I, I, I like the idea that you're able to kind of go through things slowly and kind of find your way little by little. Um, again, really cool article. Rich Rose, Guru of Reinvention, available now on The Outside Magazine. Check it out if you're looking for some motivation. Okay, that's an hour. My next one's in the show. In. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. Um, episode number 271. 
if you're listening via the podcast app and you like what you're hearing leave me a five star review that got a long way to help people find the show if you're watching listen via spotify share it let people know that you like what you're hearing if you have a question get in touch with me via email if you're watching via the youtube then smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment let me know what your thoughts are on the show and i'll see you again very very soon um of course links to my website check below excellentzinger.com links to my shows links to my blog links to my photography all the stuff that i do you can find it on there and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe hasta luego my darlings <laughs>